She's one of the most popular members of the Dutch royal family. And while her famous hats and tiaras have grabbed the international media's attention, Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands has walked the extra mile to shine a light on a cause close to her heart. A banker and financier by training, Queen Maxima has traveled the world as the United Nations Secretary General Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development, a mission beyond her constitutional duty as the consort of the Dutch King, Willem Alexander. I'm Stadfaas in Senegal's capital, Dakar. For her first trip since the COVID-19 pandemic, Queen Maxima, in her UN capacity, visits West Africa, a region she prioritizes to increase financial and digital inclusion along with financial health. Her four-day tour began in Ivory Coast with a full schedule filled with contrasts. In the neighborhood of Abobo, one of Abidjan's poorest, Queen Maxima met and listened to some of the people she hopes to help. And in an attempt to promote and improve connectivity between cashew farmers and the industry sector, she visited a local factory. Queen Maxima of the Netherlands explained why she embarked on such a mission. Since I was a child, I wanted to change the economic lives of people. Uh, when I was 14, I decided I wanted to study economics to actually help people out. I was actually living also in a developing country where the macroeconomic situation was not very uh, uh, good. In Argentina. In Argentina. So therefore, I decided, well, this is going to be my thing. And uh, now it's about sort of agricultural development, also women development, but all basically an economic inclusion and economic empowerment. She also had the opportunity to exchange ideas with leaders from different financial institutions in the region and beyond. Here in Senegal, Queen Maxima met farming communities as well as President Macky Sall and members of his government. But once the media are gone and the red carpets are rolled up, how will the Queen ensure that these trips are fruitful and that her advocacy for financial inclusion for development will reach those who need it most? We will find out in the next half an hour. Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands talks to Al Jazeera. Your Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. I've uh, witnessed you for the last four or five days uh, in action as a, an advocate to uh, promote financial inclusion and to eradicate poverty. But I also know you as a popular, glamorous queen of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Who is Queen Maxima? What role suits you best, the poverty fighter or the glamorous queen? It's all together. Um, I think, you know, I do everything that I try to do with a lot of, with, with my own self, you know. Um, since I was 14 years old, I actually wanted to study economics, macroeconomics, because I realized in my country of birth that things didn't work for really uh, the normal people. And since then, I've had this passion, which maybe you call it glamour, maybe I call it sort of maybe where I'm born from, so this Latin American way of being, um, but also in a very Dutch diligent way. <laughs> so I think I've actually learned from a lot of pieces to actually make this work. And, and, uh, and I don't do this alone. I do this with a lot of partners, uh, the World Bank, the Gates Foundation, um, uh, the Better Than Cash Alliance, CGAP, uh, you know, IFC, and many other partners that do help me to achieve this. And for me, helping people out of poverty, that nothing that gives me a bigger kick and nothing that can give me more energy. And you slip easily back from one world of, of glamour and wealth to the other world, which is really poor. Yeah, yeah, but I don't see my normal days as glamour and wealth. It's also a lot of, you know, hard work. And my life might be seemed like a life of a queen, but I have a very normal day. My kids go to bicycle to school and they all have, you know, a budget and they have to attain themselves too. And, and, uh, And we work, work very hard, so I don't see myself, you know. And I think, in any case, I have to use my position to improve the lives of others, and I think that that's what I've been trying to do. We will get back to that later, but I want to go back to what you said, your childhood, growing up in, uh, in Argentina. You said you were 14, right, when you decided mm -hmm. to become an economist. And it was a very, very difficult time for Argentina, yeah. a very bad crisis, a debt crisis, the banks were going uh, bankrupt, lots of poverty. Can you remember the first images 
in your life of poverty? What was your first experience? I think my, my, my biggest shock when, is when I saw really what inflation did to people with less means and they had no way to protect themselves against that inflation. You know, whilst people that could actually sort of access better, better means of protection, they could actually buy dollars back then or, or put in a very good sort of, you know, saving account that actually would also controvert the inflation. And to see people holding onto these pesos and they had no means of actually fighting this inflation and losing by the end of the month half of their income in the hike of prices, that really shocked me. I said, my God, we have to do things differently. Is there an image that, that still is in your, your no, mind? No, just seeing people. And seeing after a very big sort of inflation shock, you could actually see more people, beggars in the street, more people in the street really not being able to find a home. And, uh, and I see that every time in every country I go after sort of a very big crisis. You see the impoverishment. We don't have to have the numbers to see it. You see it in the streets. So you decided people need bank accounts, they need uh, financial inclusion, that's what you and believe bank, in. You know, financial inclusion is a means to an end, it's not an end in itself. Become, people do not become better because they have an, a bank account. But when they do have a bank account, when they have a means to actually save, when they have, when, and then they start saving, they could actually become sort of more credit worthy and then they actually do get a credit to actually invest in their business. And then one of the biggest issues is that we know that people, once they fight very hard to get out of poverty, then a member of the family gets sick or they have an accident or the rain doesn't come and they fall back into poverty. So insurance is extremely important in these cases. And then let's not misregard the importance of payments because how many women actually sort of get a payment and they have to take a bus to actually go and make the deposit in the bank or actually get the payment from the state. And they, they, sometimes the bus fare is actually half of the payment they get from the state and they're two days in the bus and leaving their businesses and their families behind. So being able to actually get that cash transfer that the state gives to you in your home, on your mobile phone, is just priceless. It's also secure. It's also what gives them security. You said before you used this function as, as, as the queen of the Netherlands to help with this job, right? Mm -hmm. Where exactly does it help? Well, the fact in the beginning it did help because, of course, uh, uh, having this position, it does bring people together. But afterwards, you have to learn the métier, like we say, and, and really get internalized in all the details because you know, it's, the devil is in the detail in these issues. If we talk about sort of, you know, how do we do that more women have more access to mobile banking, for example, well, first of all, they have to have access to a phone. And then I need to know the cost structure for women. How, is it really costly? Is it more costly here in Senegal than it is in Benin or it is in Kenya to actually not only own a phone, but pay the, you know, the bundle? Um, and then I have to sort of be able to discuss with the, the ministers to say, you know, listen, your price is very high because of this and this and that, and this is what you'd be doing. So, you know, I'm depending on so many infrastructural issues that I need to know to the detail uh, of why these issues are the, the way they are to help them better. But the doors of ministers and presidents open more easily because you're a queen. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, I've been doing this for around 15 years. So I have a track record, uh, I hope, not only myself, but also with all our partners in you know, that this issue has been working. You know? Of course, in the very beginning, when I had to knock the doors and they just sit down and listen to me, you know, why should I be listening to a queen talking to me about financial inclusion? But now I know, I'm known, together with all my partners, that you know, we've actually brought success. More than 1.4 billion people had had more access to financial services in the last nine years. So there is a success story to be told. And I think that also mobilizes people. Still like 40% has not, right? Not, but we're going to have at the end of uh, this month all the new figures. And I'm very confident that we've, got, we've also made a big jump in the last three years. But are you disappointed that it's not going as fast as you would like to? because it's still nearly half the population living from cash? Uh, well, you know, we've come from such a low base and certain countries, you know, are now nearly completely financially included. And I couldn't speak to all the countries at once, right? So uh, I, we started with 25 countries. Most of the 25 countries are by now like 80% included, so I need to go to the next level of countries. So um, I guess it's also a question of, of you know, trying being able to give the attention to all the countries that actually need it and to prioritize. 
We've seen you going into a lot of meetings with high-ranking officials in the Ivory Coast and here in Senegal. You also met uh, President Macky Sall. How are you ensuring that uh, when the, the photo opportunities they want to have also with you, when the red carpets are rolled up and you go home, that they actually implement what, they, what, what you have been asking for? Well, a good example now is just with uh, the, the Ministry of Finance. The Minister of Finance actually has launched this national strategy of financial inclusion. And I said to them, listen, and I'm very nice to actually have a whole report with a, with a strategy, but much, much more important it is to implement it and coordinate among different uh, ministries and also private sector players and with a central bank that is regional. So what we do is actually we have all our, my partners that actually are also on the ground. They're going to be, we actually said, we're going to help you with this, this and this and that with very timely bound deadlines. And also uh, they ask me every six months to have a conference call with them. So we do that, you know, via Zoom or whatever. And um, so we control it and uh, we also give, by then I also have an analysis what has been done or not done. So I can keep on insisting. And um, it, it, it does work very well. I've done it with several countries. And uh, that works very well to actually keep the rhythm and the pace of transformation. Of, of course, uh, watch the whole uh, journey, the trip that you made last week. And what I also noticed that uh, the media reports about your trip are for a lot of percentages, maybe 80%, about what you're wearing, about the designer, the, the clothes you're wearing. Does that frustrate you? Well, you know, there's press freedom, so um, I guess I cannot say much about it. Uh, I just would, you of, like course, of course, I would like it to be much more on the content uh, than it is or what I'm wearing, um, if that is the case. But I would also see very good uh, uh, media, you know, covering what I'm doing and not what I'm wearing. So um, I prefer to focus on that. The African countries also are a bit disappointed with, uh, for example, uh, Western countries and Western aid. How, how sure are you that they actually really want to listen to a Western queen? Well, I, don't, I cannot say about the disappointment. I think that you know, that's something that is beyond my capacity to actually make an analysis of it. Um, I think, and then it goes, goes back to the whole re, uh, question you said before, they're not only talking to a queen, they're speaking to a special advocate for the Secretary General of the you know, United Nations. And that means they're also representing me. So those 193 member states that are actually united the United Nations, I'm also representing them. So, um, and also because I've done this for so, a long, you know, so many years, somewhere there's this credibility um, that, that, you know, that gives them the reason to take me seriously and to really go into technical issues. You're also really uh, strongly coming out for women empowerment. Um, I read somewhere in your uh, university years, you were kind of a bit of a rebel. You stood up in a theology class against a, a priest who said that uh, women should serve men. Uh, and then you asked, why am I actually studying then? And, and you were actually removed from class. What, what does that say about you? I think it's pretty clear. Don't you think so? <laughs> um, on many levels, I think it is of utmost importance to actually support women develop themselves. Um, it is good for the women themselves and to be independent, uh, but it's also good for society as a whole. We know that we invest in a woman, we invest in the whole families and the kids are going to go more to school. I mean, and we were in Cote d'Ivoire, and this lady said to me, apart, you know, when she started having this whole program in which she has savings and uh, sort of a little bit of insurance uh, to actually sort of put in, 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 their, in their little uh, companies. And two of them said, you know, my children are going to university. She didn't even finish her school herself. Mm. So, you know, this is the effect on investing in women. And I have to say also, I, um, I think that women are extremely capable of doing so many good things and I, we have to just give them the opportunity. And in this case, that's why we're now trying with the African Union to have this very big program of digital and financial inclusion for women because women are less likely to own a phone and less likely to it's use the internet. Gap. There's a huge gap. It is closing very little by little and I don't, do not want to generalize because, for example, in Senegal, this gap is 
shrinking and Cote d'Ivoire, it was widening. Um, but we need to work a lot more in including the women in the system. If they do not have a phone, they will not be included in the economic system, at least not fully. And these type of issues we need to fight for uh, because it's like investing, it's such a small investment that would actually have such a big return. Because when we do that, I mean, they will be able to do so much more. And they're also part of the 50% of the agricultures are women. If we need an agricultural revolution in Africa, we need the women. But where did that come from in that university? Uh, where did that come from, from you? What role model did you have? Um, I think my father was amazing in supporting me. I mean, he had seven daughters, so I think he, he had to invest in daughters, otherwise <laughs> he knew what his old age would actually come. That's a joke. But, um, he was so good at uh, giving us a lot of support and, uh, uh, you know, letting us know that women can be as good as men. And um, he was very supportive. And he would never, uh, whatever we had in our minds, he always said to us, speak up and, and tell us what you think. So, um, yeah, he thought he really uh, was very much about equal opportunities. Well, your father was a minister of agriculture, right, in the Argentinian government of the mm. Fidela regime back then. So is that an example for you, the, the, the agricultural, the farming interest you have? Do you mean, is that the reason why I'm also interested in farming? It's, it's, it's a double thing, I think. Uh, on the one hand, yes, I do have an emotional attachment to farming because I grew up talking about farmers, yields of farming, uh, different products, how to, you know, the importance of exporting, the importance of subsistence farming, the importance of um, also the value chains that need to be supported. Uh, so that, that's what I heard all my life, right? So of course I do have an understanding or at least an emotional bond with it. But also, to be honest with you, if we have to fight poverty, most of the poor people, certainly here in Africa, live in the rural areas. And um, there's this, the subsistence farmers that actually are really trying to make uh, ends meet in a very tough way. And we need to really invest a lot more in farming. I mean, if we're talking about sort of increasing livelihoods, we have a deficit of billions of dollars annually to invest in uh, food you know, production in all its uh, ways from the very start to at least the, 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 the transformation of, of, of agricultural products. So we need to really focus how to engage with the farmers a lot better. Uh, we have uh, 550 million smallholder farmers around the world that are not getting the credit nor the services they need to really make that change and we thoroughly miss it. You are uh, in university hoping, of course, that women would be empowered uh, in your lifetime in, in a satisfying way. If you look at the situation right now, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, we still haven't had a female prime minister. And also looking at the situation here in Africa with the gender gap and women still being more in poverty than, than men, if you look at the, compare the situation. What went wrong? Well, I don't, I don't think one should actually say what went wrong. I think uh, even here in Senegal, I was just being told that, you know, about 20 years ago, uh, women could not even inherit nor own anything, not even allowed to be, have a bank account. And they now can actually inherit and, and own a bank account. And uh, there are many women ministers here in, in, in Senegal that was unthinkable of many years ago. So there, are, there have been advances, absolutely but so. But quickly enough, according well, to your taste? I'm impatient. Of course, it's never quick enough. We always want more, but we cannot also deny that there has been advances. But we, of course, we need to have a lot more. Absolutely. Well, many girls, uh, our generation, grew up uh, reading fairy tale books about if you marry a prince, you'll live, live happily ever after. You are a living example, and, and, and of course, you're a modern queen with modern challenges, as you have told us. What would you tell girls who are watching this interview about this fairy tale? Does it exist? I don't think this fairy tale exists. I think it's more hard work than anything else that I've actually done. And I tell you, I was a banker in New York working 16 hours a day. So um, it's a, a lot of responsibility. And uh, also, I think if you have this position, there's a responsibility for us to make a change somewhere. And I take it very seriously. And uh, you know, this is one part of what I do also in the Netherlands. I've actually uh, done issues of music education, also um, access for SMEs 
to credit, which didn't exist before, um, try to improve the situation of SMEs in the Netherlands. I've also uh, just launched the foundation Mental Health for Youth. And um, I guess I do not stop. That's a little bit what I am. But uh, at the same time, I think that one is in this position to make a change for the people that you know surround us. Well, the monarchy in the Netherlands has also been uh, criticized uh, under pressure recently. In your role as the UN Special Advocate, do you want to reshape the role of a, of a queen, for example, to show that I, there's I, more? I do not have that pretension. I don't have that pretension. I think that every person does it the way they can and according to, to their own abilities and according to their own talents. I, I, I hope that I've actually tried to develop some talents for myself that I can actually be, make a difference in certain aspects, but I do not think that one size will fit any queen. But what, would, uh, what is the ideal queen, according to you? I don't think there's an ideal queen, and every country has a different system. And, uh, and as time changes, my daughter will actually do it in a different way than I have done it. So I don't think, uh, I think the only example one can actually give is to really go for what you love and what you really uh, makes you happy and uh, gives you energy. Because by doing that, you will actually make a difference. You, you, in the beginning, we asked about the, the two different roles that you have, and, and they're from different kinds of worlds. I'm just wondering, what experience do you have as a special advocate that really has touched you the most? Maybe on this trip, or maybe in previous trips? No, what has touched me the most is um, to see the effect uh, that has, this work has actually had on people uh, and in their lives. Um, I've actually done repeat visits to countries and uh, a couple of times I've actually visited the same person. I've done that in Bangladesh and also in a couple of other places and to see that this woman that had just one employee and was barely making ends meet and I go the four, five years later and I see she has like 12 employees and uh, she's like, you know, the person in the whole village that is actually helping the village elder uh, and she's a woman. Uh, that that's really encourages me to do all the work that is needed. And I know there's just so many more examples like that. And you sometimes take them home with you, that you think, think about the stories and, and... Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, um, I do, and I always have pictures, and I have my albums with all the, all the clients I've actually met. And uh, so that is really very nice. And, and I know, and I follow all the projects that I've actually visited. I try to follow them. And uh, some projects didn't actually materialize, or they were not that successful. But the great majority have been. And uh, I think that is really what gives me the energy and, uh, to do this work. Yeah, you're a trained economist. You were working uh, uh, at a bank uh, before you met your husband. Have you ever imagined, if you would have not met uh, the crown prince and have become a queen, how your career would have been? Yeah, I don't think it would be, uh, because the reason why I got into this is because I actually, before I met my husband, I started helping some friends on microfinance. And that was back in uh, 1998, I forget the date. Um, so it was because of that that I was asked, actually asked by the UN, because a couple of people in the microfinance world that actually asked me sort of to start uh, developing my ideas on, on, on the UN. So, uh, and I was very enticed by it. So I would have imagined that I would have actually continued with that. How difficult was it to, to, to combine it? Because as we, we said, it's a full, more than full-time job you have in the Netherlands. You do a lot. Uh, uh, promoting music in school, as you said, mental health issues, and then this whole uh, big job. Well, as I said, I don't do it alone. I have a fantastic team in New York that actually uh, helps me out. Also, somebody helps me in the Netherlands. And also many, many partners that, you know, when I leave this country, they will be following it up for me while I'm doing other things. So, um, but at the same time, you know, when you are actually doing something you like, you find the time and you find the energy because it, will, it is what it will give you even more energy and inspire you to every time be a better person and uh, every time to try to focus a little bit more. So um, I think that would be the message that I could give to any person around, or any girl around the world. Do what you're good at and do what you really, what really gives you a lot of energy because that in turn would develop itself in, in successes and, and a lot of reward. That answers my first question. You, are you a passionate poverty fighter or a, a glamorous queen? You sound very passionate about this. I hope so. <laughs> queen Maxima of the Netherlands, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. 
And thank you for paying attention to my work and uh, financial inclusion. It is so important. It can really change things. Thanks, thank you.